Paul and Jane have been married for 22 years, but it hasn't all been a bed of roses. Jane complained that she didn't have a job and Paul spent so much time on his hobbies. While Paul was often left perplexed by Jane's endless ability to find things to buy for their home. But these were minor details in what had been a long and very happy marriage. At 45, Jane remained an attractive, mature woman. She had only gained a few pounds over the years, but they seemed to land in all the right places. At school, she was rather homely and had difficulty gaining friendships and self-confidence. But many of the stars of her youth who haunted her now looked downright ugly. She worked as an office manager for a government department and was competent and respected. When they got married, Paul already thought she was very beautiful. But now she has become truly beautiful and elegant. Her secret was her absolutely outstanding body, which seemed to improve with age. She could be called voluptuous, but most of her assets were hidden under rather modest clothes. Paul kept himself in shape through his work as a self-employed and energetic project manager. With sandy hair and six feet tall, he did not stand out from the crowd, but he was extremely popular among his close circle of longtime friends. They dealt with the empty nest effect in different ways. Paul enjoyed his free time, resumed all his hobbies, and enjoyed the extra time. I felt healthier and more energetic, but I was worried about my wife, who missed her children. There was more than just missing them. She described it as emptiness. Jane had an interesting personality and managed to balance her family and social life, but as the children left for college, that luster gradually faded. Paul tried to do everything possible to give strength to his faithful and loving wife. When Jane tried to describe her situation to her friends, the phrase lack of purpose came to mind. Jane felt more withdrawn, and Paul wondered if it was menopause or depression. Paul encouraged Jane to get back to the gym, and that helped a little. She never liked it, but it helped pass the time, and she also liked the results. The small fat that appeared in the lower abdomen and on the butt was eaten. Paul thought the result was outstanding and advised Jane to show off her hard work and be happy that she felt in shape. She deserved some new outfits. He hoped it would give her a much-needed boost of confidence, along with his reassurances. Jane seemed to be paying more attention to her appearance, and Paul hoped that she was beginning to change. Dark leggings and baggy tops were replaced by fitted skirts and silk blouses, Paul thought it all looked great on her new toned body. She continued her old nights out with the girls, which Paul encouraged. In her youth, Jane did not have many admirers. They rarely approached her. Her best friend Helen took all the attention in this regard. These days, this happens more and more often, but she knew how to politely refuse any advances. Her friends were pleasant company. Helen had recently gone through a breakup but was dating again, and had a steady boyfriend whom they discussed endlessly on the phone. Jane usually returned from girls' parties happy, slightly drunk, and very talkative, and it was nice to see the old Jane on these evenings. Their sex life had slowed down a bit, but those evenings were the most likely for something to happen. Jane was quite conservative in bed, and drinking helped her relax. She was definitely making love, not sex. For her, it was all about connection and emotion. Paul complained about her lack of interest. Having married, they were both inexperienced. And with the advent of children, the initial spark seemed to have completely faded. Paul tried different approaches, was more assertive, arranged romantic dates, took her away on weekends, changed positions and places. But none of this aroused enthusiasm. Jane never objected, saying that it was all fine. But later, she still never took the initiative. When Jane mentioned a house party at Helen's, Paul agreed almost immediately. Any excuse to go out and have fun would be the best for Jane. On the night of the party, they got ready and took a taxi to Helen's. Paul thought Jane looked stunning in her figure-hugging satin dress and told her so. She smiled sweetly. Thank you. This dress makes me a little shy, but you just made me feel good. It is your gift to make people around you feel good. You are always so kind and understanding. I love you. Paul liked Jane's answer, although it was a little annoying, repeating many of the words he had heard over the years. He was a good guy. He was kind, caring, and all that. 
In his youth, this held him back. He often found himself in the role of friends with a girl whom he actually wanted to ask out. At times he felt this way with Jane, too. He was sure that she loved him, but did she really want him? And isn't he too greedy to still want both after so many years of living together? They arrived at Helen's. The place was nice with a lot of space and there were about 40 guests and a good atmosphere. Helen seemed slightly surprised to see them both. Hello, Paul. Nice to meet you. Long time no see. She looked at Jane, who smiled and nodded. Good to see you, Helen. It's a pity that you broke up, but Jane said that you were dating again. Yes, let me introduce you. Helen introduced her boyfriend, New, and they shook hands, Jane saying she'd like to introduce Paul to their friend Will. Will extended his hand. He was clearly into fitness. Paul hated handshakes, casually ignoring the firm grip. They chatted a bit, Jane introduced the others, and Paul already knew a few. He got the impression that some of the friends were surprised to see Jane with her partner in tow. He guessed it was because they rarely attended each other's social events. An hour after Paul sat down to chat, Jane walked away, moving from one group to another. Paul noticed Jane chatting with Will and New. They formed a group with Helen and a few other people going to girls' night out. Jane kept coming back and checking that Paul was okay. He noticed Will run his hand down her back as she walked back to their group. What surprised him most was that Helen didn't wave him away at first, but only looked nervously at Paul and pulled away from Will's hand. Is there something wrong? He thought about leaving or meeting them, but he didn't want to cause a scandal. Any accusation would look childish. He wondered if he should find out more and casually asked his interlocutors if they knew Helen's group, but no one could really say anything although one woman said that they went together in pairs. By the time he had time to talk to a few people, have another drink and try to organize his chaotic thoughts, Jane was not there. Paul looked around the first floor, then went into the garden. He had almost given up when he heard voices from the direction of the house and walked along the path. As Paul approached, he heard Helen clear her throat, trying to convey a warning to Jane. Jane! Jane! Paul is here. Paul couldn't believe it. Jane was kissing Will, her arms wrapped around his shoulders. She pulled away from the kiss and looked at Helen, who nodded towards Paul with raised eyebrows and some concern. Jane jumped up. Oh, Paul, um, sorry. It was just a little kiss. Maybe we had too much to drink. Paul moved towards Will, but Jane quickly stepped between them, panicking at the sight of Paul's anger. Everyone hesitated, and if Jane had not intervened, he would have attacked Will. Maybe that was a good thing. The harsh reality was that the guy looked younger, stronger, and fitter. Sorry, Paul, nothing special. I think we should talk. No, it's not worth it. It was so surreal that he couldn't fully comprehend what was happening. He had to leave before he lost his temper and stormed off with Jane screaming after him. Jane was upset. This was not how the evening was supposed to go. She kicked herself for trying to snatch a quick kiss from Will. Jane was surprised when Helen's boyfriend knew took Will out for an evening out on Thursday. He walked up to her and was absolutely charming. She wasn't used to so many compliments, especially from a much younger and handsome man. He and New teamed up, extolling the virtues of mature ladies. Will was clearly staring at her and didn't apologize for it. It was all just stunning. For the first time in her life, Jane had thoughts and desires that she wasn't sure she could or wanted to control. She still loved her husband, but Will was a heady enigma. It was interesting to meet and communicate with different, younger, and interesting men. She found herself fixated on Will. He constantly intruded on her thoughts. The next morning, Paul and Jane were sitting at the kitchen table. Sorry, Paul. Last night was a big mistake. Everything was very confusing, and I couldn't think clearly. Time spent with friends showed us that we can experience things with other people. Not everything has to be just between you and me. There can be different aspects in our life. There's nothing wrong with friends, but he seems to be your boyfriend. Are you leaving me? Don't be stupid, Paul. He's not my boyfriend, and I don't want to leave you at all. You and I sleep together every night, wake up together, 
spend our whole lives together. Except when you're hanging out with your boyfriend. I don't have a boyfriend, Paul. Don't say that. Kisses, touches. Who the hell is he then? He is a friend. And that's all. Nonsense. This was clearly not the first time. Jane hesitated, trying to talk carefully, and at the same time, trying to be truthful. She truly loved Paul, and they were destined to spend their entire lives together. I don't think I was in the right emotional state, Paul, and I want... No, I need to keep what got me out of this quagmire. I need you. Your constant support and some time with my friends. Paul shuddered. You mean time with Will? That was the problem. She knew it was wrong, but she really wanted to continue dating Will. She didn't want to hurt Paul or lie to him. He deserved honesty. I would like to continue to spend time with this group. We are all great friends. Paul growled. Especially Will, I guess. You are far from friends. Are you having an affair? No, absolutely not. This is not a novel. Well, I have a very distinct feeling that your other friends are well aware of your affair with this guy. Stop saying it's an affair. They see us together more often than you and me, that's all. I think that, in itself, says a lot. He's New's friend, and we spend time together. Once you get to know him better, you will like him. I'm not going to get to know him. This man has no morals, and he's trying to seduce my wife. Unfortunately, he seems to be succeeding, but how far does it go? Mostly talking and dancing. And kisses? Yes, we kissed a few times. Nothing special. Paul looked at her. This is very special to me, and you're in damage limitation mode right now. I'm guessing it's much more than that. Even if you haven't had sex yet, everything leads to this. Our marriage is hanging by a thread, and you seem determined to end it. Are you in love with him? What? No, of course not. I think there is something... Attraction between us, we like each other, but we are just good friends, nothing more. How often did you see him? Did you look very comfortable together? Well, we meet on Thursdays, and... And I have lunch with him. Lord, are you and him on real dates? No, just lunch. He's good company. And that's flattering from a young guy. I like him, and I have no idea why. But he seems to like me, too. You just described the date. What was the point of meeting each other at the party? Was this done to humiliate me? God, no. I just wanted to introduce you to him. I thought you'd like him. He's a great guy, and I told him everything about you. I thought we could all be friends, and that would ease any tension or misunderstanding. Wait a minute. You don't expect me to agree to this? You have to understand that he will want more. It's obvious that he wants to get you into bed, and it's becoming increasingly clear that you don't mind. You're getting too far ahead of yourself. I'm not even close to it. But if we both agree and get closer to it, will it be that bad? Dear, I don't want to be unkind, but you've slowed down a little, and we couldn't find a solution to the problems with your performance. I'm sure we will, but some innocent fun with Will might help fix the situation. Jane immediately realized that she had made a terrible mistake. It looked like Paul was about to explode. She didn't want to mention the occasional erectile dysfunction, but her phrase, just good friends, seemed weak even to her. Sorry, I didn't mean, you're a bitch, so it's about sex, and that's my fault. Well, screw you, Jane. On the way out, Paul slammed all the doors. Damn it all, Jane screamed in frustration, telling herself that she was an absolute idiot. Did she even understand what she was doing? Kissing felt natural. She had no intention of going any further, but she managed to convince Paul that he would be replaced in her bed. She was in big trouble, and why did she even mention his performance? Paul had always been a terrific lover. There had only been a few occasional episodes where things didn't work out for him, but he had made amends to her, and their doctor was confident they could work things out. For that matter, it was she who did not make much effort sexually, after many years of exhausting life with children, they were never able to return to normal. The realization that her marriage was in trouble came as a shock to Jane. Paul loved her and would always be there to support her, right? She definitely loved him and cared for him as always. 
The incident with Will only added to the confusion. She was sure that it would pass. Paul felt like a complete failure. The thought of his wife leaving him because he couldn't do his job in the bedroom was absolutely crushing. He thought about moving out or separating, but decided it would be the fastest way to get Jane into bed with Will. How far has it gone? Kissing seemed like a weak reason to end a 22-year marriage, but he suspected it went much further. Then you had to think about the children and family. How would they react? Thank God they are grown now, but they will still be hurt. For now, he decided that the best thing to do would be to wait and hope that Jane would come to her senses. He knew it was a shitty plan, with little chance of success, but he didn't know what else to do. Jane was desperate to find a way to solve Paul's problems without losing anything from her current lifestyle. She was overly nice and kept apologizing for the party, but things only got worse. The next stumbling block was the planned Thursday evening. Paul, I know Thursday will be difficult for you. Seriously? Are you still going? We're going with a group of friends to have a little drink, that's all. Sharon mentioned a free movie ticket, and I thought you might want to go with her instead of brooding. What's the matter, Jane? Are you trying to set me up with our neighbor to ease your conscience? Don't be stupid, Paul. You're mine and mine alone. But we can both be friends with others, and you two have always gotten along very well. Paul shook his head. He couldn't figure out if Jane didn't notice or if she just didn't care. Come to think of it, he was the one who put all the effort into the sexual side of their relationship. Is it possible to become friends after 22 years of marriage? When Thursday evening arrived, Jane changed her outfit to a simple skirt and blouse, but still, went to the party, kissing Paul goodbye and assuring him that it was just a normal group party and that nothing bad would happen. In the end, Paul did go to the movies with Sharon. They were friends and neighbors of Sharon and her husband Mike for many years before Mike died in a car accident. Paul was amazed when he picked up Sharon. She looked very beautiful in a summer dress and wedge sandals. Her shoulder-length blonde hair was combed to one side behind her ear. The entire outfit was natural and light, which suited her personality. She blushed when Paul complimented her. Wow, you are well-dressed. You look angelic? Shut up, idiot, came the answer, and she hit him on the hand. They enjoyed the movie and then went for coffee. Paul was the perfect gentleman and Sharon was a fantastic communicator to ensure he wasn't losing his mind. Luckily, she assured him that wasn't the case, but she tried to play devil's advocate. I think we both know how important her friends are. I understand why she wants it. Yes, I agree. I never objected to friends, hobbies, and nights out. I supported them all. So, the stumbling block is the relationship with Will. Partly, there are other problems. Disrespect. Selfishness. But here we are, a man and a woman, friends in a relationship, and on a night walk. Is it really that different? Paul laughed heartily. Nice try, Sharon, and I'm sure that's exactly what Jane planned. But she admitted it went overboard. If we started kissing, it would be a completely different relationship. Sharon smiled at the thought of kissing Paul. The thought was very pleasant. They chatted casually about less painful topics. Paul, as always, asked about her and her family and listened carefully to the answers. Despite his obvious suffering, he never tired of laughing and joking. She could only guess what Jane was up to, but it all seemed so unusual. Jane was the kindest person she knew and had been very supportive after Mike's death. They agreed to meet next week if Jane went out with her group again. Jane's evening went according to plan. She vowed to keep her distance and cool Will down, and she succeeded, except for one dance when he managed to butt in. Everything was going according to plan until he offered to give her a ride home. It seemed rude to refuse, and she needed to explain the situation with Paul to him, and just ten minutes later they started kissing again. Paul sat at the kitchen table for what seemed like an eternity, after returning from an evening date with Sharon. He was already drinking his third glass of beer when Jane finally returned home. She tried to maintain a happy, carefree appearance, as if nothing had happened. You came back late. Yes, just a little bit. Who was at the party? The usual crowd. You know what I'm asking. 
Yes, Will was there, but mostly hung out with New. You should check social media before you lie anymore. Jane quickly looked. Damn. One of the girls must have taken the photo. She was in the background, standing in front of Will, who had his arm around her, pulling her towards him. It was just the end of a dance with a friend. Well, it's great that everyone sees this image of you with him, thank you. It's not humiliating at all. Did this friend give you a ride? No, yes. Damn. Jane sighed and tried to calm down. Yes, Paul, Will really gave me a lift. You look very flushed. There must have been a long makeout session. We talked about us. I told him that we should keep our distance. It's good that there are now three of us in this relationship. What else did you do? Jane's head dropped. She began to cry and was very emotional. I love you. Sorry. I don't know what's happening to me. Did you have sex? No, we didn't do it, Paul. But you wanted it. You wanted sex with him. It's strange. We don't have sex often. But suddenly you can't resist this guy. I don't know. I, I, yes. Yes, I wanted to go further, but I didn't because I love you. You love me, but I'm not as attractive to you as your boyfriend. Are you going to stop seeing him? I don't know if I can. It seems like I can't control my actions around Will. I know I'm hurting you, and that's the last thing I want to do. But that's exactly what you do, and you know it, and yet you can't or don't want to stop. Obviously, continuing your relationship with him is more important to you. I've had enough of your behavior and disrespect. I'm leaving and going to live with my brother. Jane was shocked. Please don't, Paul. I'll stop. The truth is that you don't want to stop. What you want is completely clear. Jane burst into tears. Please, please stay with me. I can't lose you. Paul ended up staying, but to say things were frosty over the next few weeks would be an understatement. Jane tried to be nice, but even simple conversations were strained. At least she was starting to miss Thursday night parties, and Paul hoped that was a good sign. He decided to make an effort to get them back on track and made a reservation at their favorite restaurant for the following Friday night. They celebrated many happy occasions there and knew the owners. Paul hoped that there would be something special and they could talk like before again. He told Jane about this hoping that she would be surprised and happy. Jane was really delighted with the invitation and thought it was a wonderful gesture. Paul is truly a kind and patient person. And then she was overcome with horror. She remembered that she had already booked a table for Friday. That's so kind, Paul. But is it possible to reschedule everything for Saturday? I think, yes. Why are you asking? Helen has tickets to a charity ball, and I promise to go. It's a big event in favor of the local hospice. Would you rather do this than come with me to try to save our marriage? No, I'm not saying that. We can do both. Sorry, but I already said I'd go. This is an important evening for Helen because she is on the organizing committee. Helen won't mind. She called me and apologized for her role in all of this. Jane hesitated, clearly trying to find some reason to reorder. She looked slightly worried. Paul didn't expect this reaction. Then it dawned on him, if this evening was so important to Helen, then all their friends should go to it. Damn, that's him, isn't it? No, it's just a big event. It's important to Helen, and everyone will go. So he won't be there? Jane looked away. Oh, now I understand. You have planned to meet your boyfriend, and Friday is the important evening? No, this is wrong. I give up, you must be joking. You begged me to stay with you and promised to stop everything, but you chose to meet with him. It's good to know where your priorities are, my dear wife. Paul hoped Jane would change her mind, but she was adamant that she couldn't miss the event. He and Helen had been planning the day for ages, booking beauty treatments and buying new dresses. Yes, there will be guys there, but so will all her other friends. This is an important event. Paul made sure he was away from home, as the death blow to his marriage began. He had hoped to avoid any communication with Jane, but he couldn't resist reading the text messages she kept sending. I'm already leaving. I'm sorry that you weren't here when I left. I love you. Great party. Very relaxing. Raising a lot of money for the hospice. There was a photo of Helen and Jane hugging, and he thought they both looked amazing. Paul had never seen Jane wear anything like this. 
It was a tight-fitting evening dress with a thigh-high slit, a deep ocean blue with silver sparkles. Paul wondered who took the photo and who was Jane dressing for. I miss you. I love you very much. Do not wait. I think the party will continue for quite some time. Don't worry, I'm fine. Having a great time. See you soon. I decided to stay at Helen's because I was very drunk. See you tomorrow. I really love you. It was almost 11 o'clock in the morning when Jane returned home. She walked into the kitchen and couldn't bring herself to look at Paul. Paul just knew. There was no point in even asking if she had sex. Finally, Jane was able to look at him. Sorry. You always apologize. It just happened. It wasn't planned. I don't think that's true, Jane. It was all very much planned. Was it worth it? Did it rock your world? I don't want to go into details, Paul. He was full of enthusiasm. It felt different than with us, but I think I've already dealt with it. Just great for you. I'm leaving. Really? Again, threatening to run away to your brother instead of facing our problems? No, this time there are no threats, and these are your problems, not ours. Goodbye, Jane. And then Jane noticed a packed suitcase and backpack in the dressing room. She desperately tried to think of something to make him stay, but she couldn't. What she did to him was terrible. She really didn't think about the consequences of the decision she made the previous night in a drunken stupor. She thought she would have time to explain everything and apologize properly. Paul left without another word. His phone started ringing before he reached the end of the street, but he ignored it. By the time he reached his brother, Jane had sent 27 messages. He read them. They all basically contained apologies and pleas to return. Jane couldn't believe Paul was gone. Without him, the house seemed not the same. She heard a knock on the door and, hoping it was Paul, hurried to open it, only to see Sharon on the threshold. Jane immediately burst into tears and received a comforting hug in return. She told Sharon her version of what happened before last night. Most of the events coincided with what Sharon Paul described, but Jane explained everything differently. At times it sounded like nothing more than innocent tomfoolery, and then it turned into a romantic fairy tale. Sharon did not hold back her opinion. How would you feel if Paul and I kissed? You're crazy if you risk losing him, especially to some boy trying to get on top of you. Jane got furious. You're a bitch. You've always liked him. You're after my Paul. Sharon smiled patiently. We are friends, and I would never try. But if you throw him away, I might do so. Jane burst into tears even more. I think I might have thrown it away. Last night. I... I... Oh, please tell me you didn't do it. You're a complete idiot. Having received no support from Sharon, Jane called Helen. What were you thinking, girl? Guys like New and Will are fun but only for short-term flings. You don't abandon a man like Paul for them, and you certainly don't rub his face in it. I thought I just needed to get it out of my head by having sex with Will and then focus on Paul. Helen groaned, thinking Jane was a naive fool. Paul would never agree with that. The thing is, Helen, sex with Will was wonderful. I had an amazing time. He is so trained and toned, his skin is perfect, and he was absolutely hard because of me. It wasn't about size or technique. It was just that we needed each other so desperately. This has been building up for months. He said that I was the sexiest he ever had. Helen couldn't help herself. Oh, God, tell me all the details. It was so amazing, just the way Will looked at me. His eyes were full of lust. Then there were compliments. And the nature of the conversation. It was permeated with sexual chemistry. I've never felt so wanted. It was obvious that we both wanted this to happen more than once. Was he good? He was amazing. That's great, Jane. But what about you and Paul now? Honestly? I don't know. I was hoping that I could switch to Paul and get us back on track, but I don't think he will come back and I can't blame him. It makes me feel terrible, but at the same time, last night felt like it changed my whole life. For weeks, Jane begged Paul to return, but he did not return. She was worried about him. His brother and sister-in-law were good people, but it wasn't the same as being cared for by a wife. She knew he would miss her despite her actions. In the end, she accepted that the matter was hopeless, even if she behaved better. 
her actions would separate them forever. Jane decided that the kindest thing she could do was to let Paul move on and stop pursuing him. Despite her actions, she was sure that she loved him, and that meant letting him go before she hurt him further. They had to keep in touch because of the children, and they managed it very well, getting along well with each other. There was no talk of divorce, but they agreed to continue paying half the mortgage each and treat the house as an investment, selling or buying it back when either of them wanted or needed it. Despite refusing to return home, Jane was surprised that Paul dealt with his anger and resentment so quickly. She deserved and expected even more attacks and accusations. Then it dawned on her what could be causing this. Are you dating someone? Maybe Sharon? Sharon, where did you get the idea? You always got along so well and she showed interest. Is it true? I had no idea. Either way, she's dating someone else. And I think I'm dating Marie. Marie, the receptionist at your job, oh my God, she might only be 35. Paul snapped back. She's older than your will anyway. Jane's initial irritation immediately evaporated and she paused, trying to collect her thoughts. Sorry, Paul, she's a good girl, and I hope everything works out for you. This is just the beginning. Paul and Marie went on several dates. Paul wondered if his problems were related to Jane's lack of interest and desire for him. There was no doubt that the two of them had spent most of the night enjoying a wonderful and exhausting time together. The mention of Marie made Jane realize that Paul was moving on. Having come to terms with the fact that he would not return, her social life took off. She began seeing Will regularly, and sex continued to be a revelation to her. She loved feeling wanted and being the center of his attention. Jane discovered that she liked to flirt and that she was good at it. Many guys were very interested, especially after they found out that she had broken up. Her wardrobe has completely changed. Will always begged her to wear tight clothes, usually a skirt or dress that showed off her assets, and high heels. They enjoyed shopping for lingerie. He bought her a range of costumes, including a sexy maid outfit and a nurse uniform, complete with stockings. Jane allowed him to take photographs of her in these clothes. In 22 years of marriage, she had never asked for sex. It dawned on her that she had missed out on so much with Paul. If she had been more open with him, they could have explored all these things together. It was entirely up to her, and Paul, being a kind and respectful guy, never insisted on it. She remembered him trying, but chalked it up to him being a typical sex-obsessed guy. Now she wondered how much of her lack of effort influenced Paul and made her open to a man like Will. Talking during sex was new to Jane, but it really turned her on. Will asked if she liked it. What does she want? What does it feel like? And she reciprocated his feelings, asking if he liked it. After that, she laughed at herself. After many years spent in a sexual dungeon, she really loved sex. She wasn't in a serious relationship with Will, and she knew he was still seeing other women. So when the handsome young guy at work, Rob, flirted with her, she encouraged it. And eventually, he plucked up the courage to ask her out, and she readily agreed. When she arrived at the restaurant, her companion's mouth opened wide. Her usually professional business suit had been replaced by a black velvet dress with a halter neckline that showed off her cleavage. She really liked his reaction, but for the first ten minutes he could barely speak due to his nerves. Jane placed her hands on top of his. Relax, honey, we're just friends, just chatting, there's no need to impress me. I like you anyway, and tonight will be your chance to score points. After the initial shock, it worked, and Rob relaxed, and they had a pleasant evening. They walked through the front door together, kissing passionately, their hands free to explore each other's bodies. Jane tore Rob's shirt off and ran her hands over his chest, abs, and jeans. With their mouths still pressed together, Jane pulled down his trousers and helped him out of the rest of his clothes. She pushed him onto the bed and slowly undressed in front of him, enjoying the fact that his eyes burned with desire and did not leave her body. Removing her dress, Jane revealed a matching bra, thong, and suspender belt, complete with silk stockings. She only took off her thong before laying down on him. Do you like what you see, Rob? Yes, you are like a goddess. That's good, baby, because this goddess likes you and really needs good sex. 
For the first time in her life, Jane felt the pleasure of being more assertive and aggressive. She really enjoyed taking things into her own hands. In the following months, Jane dated other guys. One of them asked her to date, but she said it was too early for her. In reality, she still only had one person she thought about in that way. Jane and Will continued to experiment and even tried to switch with Helen. It was no surprise that Helen liked New. He was an exceptional lover and well-endowed. Helen, after all, was not exaggerating, and Jane did not deny it, taking full advantage of it. She wanted to do the night again, but Will seemed a little jealous and rejected the idea. She did not insist, thinking that she could come to an agreement with Helen. All this was a revelation to Jane, whose sex life had been rather sparse in her marriage. Despite this, she longed for the intensity of love she shared with Paul. No one but him came close to this. She missed just talking to him. She often started a conversation, and only then realized that he was not there. Seeing the places where he sat, and imagining what he would have done if she had not betrayed him, she often cried, it hurt her to be without him. Jane was surprised when Paul knocked on the door one day, looking very embarrassed. She invited him in and made coffee. I need to ask you a favor, Jane. Of course, about anything. It's not easy to say, but the business is experiencing difficulties. I have additional expenses and problems with cash flow. I managed to send the same money to my children, but I have a hard time paying off my half of the mortgage on this house. I'll sort it out, but the money will come late. Jane thought for a moment. We can sell it if you want, Paul. It was good that you let me stay in it. No, that's not the point. It's a good investment for both of us. Until we're ready to sell or buy it back from each other, I just need some extra time. Fine. How about I cover the payments? I have some savings. No, I was just thinking about asking the bank to defer payments for a while. I can't use your savings. Jane smiled, knowing that was exactly what Paul was going to say. They may not have been together, but she knew him better than anyone else. Paul, for many years you provided for our family and never let us down. Compared to this, this is nothing. Nothing at all, I insist. Paul looked awkward. I don't think... It's somehow wrong. Honestly, I'm glad I can do this. I have no doubt at all that you will sort everything out. You always do. I'll be happy to give you money. Well, call it a loan, if it helps. Paul seemed to be deep in thought. Maybe a loan, but we need a written agreement to make everything official. Jane smiled. As you wish, Paul. You are the most honest person I have ever known. You will do what you say. You will return the money to me. And you have already started thinking about paying me interest. I, of course, will refuse. But you already know that. Paul managed to smile at this remark. We know each other really well. I think we've agreed. And, Jane? Thank you. It's the least I can do. Either way, I am the reason for our breakup and the additional financial burden you are struggling with. Jane shed a tear as Paul left, their conversation a happy reminder of hundreds, maybe even thousands of similar interactions over the years. She would gladly give Paul anything he asked for. Jane had a reputation at work as being hot and had a constant stream of potential lovers who wanted to date her. She often heard them talk about her as a hot wife or a cougar, and it delighted her. In her youth, she had always been homely, and such attention was new and exciting for her. Jane was enjoying the best sex of her life and had no qualms about having it. She knew that some people would call her a slut, but she decided to accept it thinking that a guy in the same position could be called a Casanova. Her dates were a lot of fun, but she felt lonely most of the time, which was a little tiring. As expected, the breakup was emotionally traumatic, but she should have forgotten about it by now and enjoyed life to the fullest. So why doesn't she feel better? Jane regularly saw Paul and Marie together. She felt the usual pang of jealousy, but immediately reproached herself. After all, she had caused it herself. She noticed how easily they spoke and how comfortable they were around each other, often smiling and laughing. She still wanted the best for Paul. He was a good man and deserved it. This was in stark contrast to her own short relationships, even if the right man offered something more serious. 
she found a reason to refuse. Despite what Jane saw, Paul and Marie's relationship began to falter. They liked each other but lacked the spark. Perhaps it was too fast for Paul, and Marie was much younger. The sex had always been wonderful and had gone a long way toward rebuilding Paul's self-esteem, and their genuine friendship had helped overcome his anger. They felt it at the same time and agreed to be friends, even friends with benefits. Marie insisted that they must continue to have fun in bed until she finds her betrothed. Paul and Jane were standing on the railway platform, seeing their children off to university after the Easter holidays. They spent time with both parents getting used to the new routine, and everything went relatively smoothly. Jane smiled at Paul. Would you like to have some coffee? Of course, why not? After the story about the children, there was an awkward silence. Everyone lost in their own thoughts. Jane filled in the blank. I'm really sorry that things turned out this way, Paul. I loved, still love you, and I ruined everything. Was it worth it? Did you find what you were looking for? It's hard to answer. I've lost so much with you, but I have to admit that I enjoyed exploring other things. Paul laughed. By other things, you mean a lot of sex with hot young guys? Jane smiled. I'm glad you can laugh about it, Paul. This is partly true, but I miss friendship and communication. Paul frowned. So that's what we were to you in the end? Friendship without attraction or desire? Jane was shocked. No. Why do you think so? You've never been so interested sexually, that is? Then another guy came along and suddenly you couldn't resist and now you can't seem to get enough. There were tears in Jane's eyes. Please don't ever think like that. I have always loved you and still love you. I took our relationship for granted and didn't put any effort into it. There were always more important things that I put first. Children, friendship, myself. Don't ever think that I didn't love or want you. If we had done what you advised, I think we would still be together. It revealed a side of me that I never knew I had. It's a shame I didn't discover it with you. Paul was surprised by Jane's answer. She seemed sincere. He was still trying to process her comments when she continued. I'm glad you're experiencing everything with Marie. I don't have that. Communication mixed with the fact that you obviously can't keep your hands off each other. She is a lucky girl, and I am truly happy for you both. The floor fluctuates. Yes, we... Everything is fine, but it's more like friendship with benefits. Hilarious, but I hope she finds someone she can settle down with and love completely. Jane was surprised. And it's not you? No, unfortunately, I don't think so. She needs someone her age. We're still friends and our sex is fantastic, but neither of us has that feeling. It's hard to explain. There are so many great things about our relationship, but something is missing. Jane sighed. Yes, I remember this feeling. We had it. Before I lost him. She's an idiot for letting you go, isn't there anyone else? A few dates, but nothing serious. I can't find a partner. Jane's thoughts began to race, and before she had time to consider all the consequences, she blurted out, Maybe you should date me. Paul was silent for what seemed like hours, but in reality it was only moments. Jane was already beginning to regret her remark and began to think about how to laugh it off. Paul then smiled, or was it a grimace, but then stopped and looked at Jane with a sigh. Maybe it's worth it. They both shrugged, Jane holding her breath while Paul still seemed deep in thought. Let's see. An exceptionally attractive woman, great breasts and legs, usually on display. I know she's partying and not looking for anything serious. What could go wrong? Jane blushed, smiled, and realized that now she was happy in a way that she had not been happy for a very long time. They agreed to try for lunch the following Friday, giving each other enough time to change their minds and decline. Jane, for her part, was delighted, feeling like a perky schoolgirl looking forward to her first date. Paul wasn't sure if he was making a mistake by telling himself it was nothing serious, just another date with a pretty woman. Jane was enjoying her morning shopping, choosing a new dark purple cocktail dress belted at the waist, which barely hid her assets. 
She put on her makeup, including red lipstick, and then chose a matching red bustier and French panties. The dress required nylon stockings, and after much hesitation, she chose a suspender belt and black seamed stockings. She wondered if it was too much and would scare Paul away, but he was dating a brand new Jane, so she decided to go for it. It was obvious that Paul liked her outfit and complimented her. Their conversation was light and comfortable, with a slight sexual tension. Jane had to constantly take big breaths to calm herself down. Memories came flooding back to both of them. They had a lifetime of shared experiences to talk about. It was the best date they could remember. Jane invited Paul to come over. Sex was not even a question. They could hardly keep their hands off each other. They kissed urgently and passionately, their mouths melting into each other. As they kissed, Paul's hands explored Jane's soft bottom and the swell of Jane's breasts that seemed so familiar. They stripped down to their underwear in the hall, Paul being equal parts, shocked and delighted by Jane's underwear, insisting that she keep her stockings and heels on. Jane moaned as Paul kissed her shoulders. It was amazing, urgent, hot, and erotic. But what shocked Jane the most was the intensity of the feeling, the love, and the emotion. It was the best experience of her life. At the end, she was so emotionally shaken that she cried and laughed at the same time. Paul turned to face her. Wow, looks like we both learned something new. Jane stroked his face. That's for sure. It was amazing. Not bad, probably, for an elderly guy with problems at work. I shouldn't have said that. I was looking for any excuse for my behavior, but it was never true. And what you just did to me was the best experience of my life. Are you saying it was better than with Will? I assume you are doing this out of kindness. Jane hesitated. If you really want to know it was amazing with Will, I had no idea it could be like that. She began to get emotional, her voice breaking and her eyes filling with tears. But what we just did, physically it's on par with him, and the emotional connection we have made, everything so much better. Paul laughed. Fair enough and just as well because I'm tired and I need to get some sleep. You've exhausted me. They lay together kissing and caressing, before falling into a deep sleep. After her first night with Paul, Jane began to panic. She told herself it was just another date, but she wasn't sure she could handle that level of emotion. If things went wrong, she would be upset, and she didn't want to hurt Paul again. They met several more times, with both dating others. Will moved away, but Jane was seeing other guys, and Paul was still dating Marie. She wasn't sure he'd want anything more than a casual relationship, and she was afraid to ask in case she'd lose him again. Everything changed when they ran into each other in a bar in the city center. Jane was on a date. They had just entered the bar when Paul was already leaving, having finished drinking with a client. Jane introduced her husband to her companion, Justin. Justin became jealous and decided to mark Paul's place, hinting at what he and Jane would do that night. Jane wasted no time in making it clear that the date would be short-lived if his bad behavior continued and that her husband would always be her priority. Paul was shocked by Jane's statement, but not as much as her companion, who sulked and walked away towards the bar. Jane apologized to Paul and asked him to wait for her at the door. She returned to her companion. I need to leave. Thanks to your bad behavior and attempt to disgrace my husband, I'm leaving with him. Her companion was at a loss, caught between anger and apology. Jane continued, Maybe we can go somewhere next weekend, thanks. You just made sure my husband will try very hard to win me back tonight. Oh, and don't ever ask me to choose. He will always win. With that, Jane turned and walked away, clicking her heels to join hands with Paul and walk away together. Her companion watched her ass retreat, cursing his loose tongue, the day after the restaurant confrontation and two months after they started dating again, they were sitting at a downtown bar sharing a bottle of wine. Paul saw the worried look on Jane's face. Are you okay? What happened? I really like it with you, but I wonder if you see this as something more than casual dates and hot sex. I don't know, to be honest. I like it too, but maybe it's better not to force things. 
I loved that last night. You left your boyfriend for me and said that I was your priority. You will always be like that. I know I haven't shown it to you in the past, but you have always been my one true love. I enjoy dating and sex, but still feel pretty lonely. I don't have what you and Marie have, someone to share with. Actually, Marie started dating someone and we stopped, you know, and I'm planning on moving in. Where? I think to my brother, although Cindy, his wife, is expecting a child. Stupid idea. At first she couldn't bring herself to say it, but then she blurted out anyway and couldn't stop. Are you thinking of moving in with me? Well, not as husband and wife or anything like that, but as a boarder or boarder or... Actually, you're still a co-owner, so you have every right to move in. Anyway, if you want... The offer still stands. We could be friends or something. The last remark was accompanied by a nervous wave of her hand before Jane's voice trailed off. Friends with benefits, Paul asked, with a big smile on his face. Absolutely. We're still married anyway, so you have the right to do that. I guess that makes you a sexy wife and makes me some kind of trash, Jane laughed. I don't think that's true, considering how much you talk about it and the fact that you left me as soon as I cheated with Will. I think we could give it a try. I know what I'm getting into, and as long as we're honest with each other. I enjoy being with you, and I always have, but I don't want to go back to that grumpy, borderline depressed housewife. I still want to date others, and I insist that you date too, otherwise it won't be fair. Paul smiled, remembering. You know, I always liked that housewife, and in my eyes you were never clumsy. I know, it was so unusual and I was a damn idiot. I let you down and ruined our marriage. I don't want to hurt you again. Paul tried to weigh the consequences before giving in. It was too much for his brain to handle. To hell! I think we can try. Paul moved in with her with the idea of using the spare room, but that idea was abandoned on the first night, and they shared their old bedroom. The sex was as emotional as it was exciting. They quickly returned to many of their old habits. Everything was familiar and comfortable. Despite this, both were nervous about new relationships and continued to date others, although the frequency of this had decreased significantly. Their sex life developed rapidly. They experimented in ways that had never been possible in marriage. Jane thought about Paul's comment about the hot wife. She was wondering how she, an ordinary middle-aged housewife, married to a completely normal and loving husband, came to have so much sex with different partners. Just nine months ago, her sex life would have been considered vanilla. The path was not easy. But was she satisfied that she had completed it? She still didn't know the answer. Over time, Jane cut back on her excesses, enjoying spending more time with Paul. Her dates had dwindled to once a month, usually with the nervous Rob, her first lover since Will. She was happy to see his newfound confidence and how he had matured, crediting her for helping him along the way. There were also difficult moments. Both felt a little awkward preparing for dates when the other was in the house. Just this evening, Paul caught Jane getting ready for a date, fastening her stockings to her waist with suspenders. This caused them both to hesitate and try to calm their surging emotions. One night, while lying in bed, Jane apologized again for her girl's night out with Helen. Are you still seeing her? Not often. Sometimes. Things didn't work out between her and New, and now she's working a lot. Did she tell you that she asked me out on a date? Never. When did it happen? She called several times and apologized for her role in what was happening. About a month after I left, she asked if I would consider dating her in the future if we didn't get together. She offered to leave New and said that I was exactly the type of guy she had always been looking for. I was shocked. She was a beauty, and it was a much-needed ego boost. Helen said I was stupid to risk losing you for Will, but it seems she was serious. Were you dating her then? No, not then, but I ran into her a few months later and, well, you know. Oh, wow. I think you had a good time. Helen is stunning and great in bed. Paul raised his eyebrows. Do you know that too? Maybe, Jane laughed. I experimented a lot after we broke up. You didn't meet her anymore? No, she offered. But it seemed to me that we were too close. If I couldn't trust you, 
then Helen couldn't trust me. That, and the fact that she had your back. Jane fell silent. I hate to think that I made you lose trust in others. Helen was my best friend. She tried to warn me that I was getting too close to Will, but she didn't stop me. She was happily married for many years until her husband cheated on her. She's not a bad person. I can't blame anyone else. It's all because of me. They were sitting comfortably watching TV when Paul's phone rang. It was Sharon, sobbing uncontrollably. He couldn't make out the words, but it was obvious that she had broken up with her fiancé. Paul apologized to Jane and went to Sharon. It took several hours to find out the whole story of the breakup. The guy left her for his ex. For Sharon, all this came as a complete surprise. Paul hugged her and told her everything would be okay. She was so upset that he feared for her safety. He managed to calm her down and put her to bed and ended up staying in the spare room and calling Jane to bring her up to speed. Jane supported him and arrived the next day with lunch and cans of ready-made soup. When Paul noticed all the jars, Jane smiled and said that was all she ate during their breakup. She barely ate anything else for two months. Paul was surprised that Jane was so upset. He assumed that she had continued her new exciting sex life the very next day after he left. They maintained daily contact and helped Sharon through her long, slow healing. Eventually, Paul convinced her to start going to the movies with him again. She loved movies, especially reruns of classics from the 50s. This led to her spending other evenings with him, eventually including murder mystery evenings peppered with characters from Agatha Christie novels set in the 1920s and 30s. Jane's dating stopped as Rob found himself a new girlfriend. He thanked Jane for everything she had taught him, and she wished him luck in his new novel. Sex more than satisfied her needs, and she found that she wanted, that it was possible, to be faithful. She knew she still loved Paul and had never loved anyone else. In their previous life, as she described it to herself, she took him for granted. Now she found herself enjoying his company. She spent almost all her time with him and enjoyed it. The dates were fun and exciting. Paul was interesting and good company, and a consistent man you could count on. She was jealous of him for Sharon, but took it as further evidence of what a good person he was. With his time divided between Jane and Sharon's support, Paul had little time to date anyone else. Paul and Jane were sitting on the back porch enjoying a beer and a glass of wine. Paul, do you think we could be a married couple again? I haven't been dating anyone for the last four months, and I would like to be only yours. This proposal took Paul by surprise. I don't know, Jane. This is a big step, and I'm not sure. I love you, Paul, and I want you back completely. I need to think. Can I take some time? Of course. As much as you need, just know that I am always there and have always loved you. A week later, they were sitting in the same places again. Do you regret the past, Jane? Paul waited, intrigued to see how Jane would respond. No, now you are in my life again. I'm sorry for how things happened and how I treated you. I fell in love with Will, and all Helen's stories about New made me feel like I was missing something in my life. I can blame age and menopause, but I became very selfish and let you out of my sight. I never thought that you would leave me. I wish we had explored more together years ago, and it was my fault. I'm glad I found that sexy side of myself, but I wish it was just between us. It took a long time before Paul responded, I still bitterly regret it. We made the best of a bad situation, but I lost the security of my marriage and my trust in people. I still don't think I've fully recovered, and I need to do that. Jane was shocked. She assumed that Paul would react positively. After all, everything was going well between them. Life together was wonderful, and they both undoubtedly benefited from the experience. You can trust me, Paul. You know that I stopped dating, and I will always be honest with you. You were honest for the first time. You knew what you were doing. You knew how it would affect me. And you continued anyway, at the same time telling me that you loved me. His voice trembled and fell silent. Tears welled up in Jane's eyes. She was horrified, realizing that they had not restored their relationship, but simply covered up the cracks. Paul took a deep breath. 
I talked to Sharon about your proposal, and she surprised me with an alternative. She asked me to consider moving in with her. Paul and Sharon's growing feelings were undeniable. They always got along like friends, their conversations were light and relaxed. In recent months, both had felt attracted, but had been hesitant, and now Jane's request had forced them to address the issue. Sharon stopped holding back. She saw this as her last chance to tell Paul how she really felt about him. I still love you, Jane, and maybe I can even trust you again, but I don't want to forget what you did. I think it's unfair to trust someone so completely that this illusion is shattered. Please don't do this, Paul. I've changed. You can trust me. And if Will or Rob came back, would you give them up? Perhaps. But I will never be sure. History cannot be undone. And I know you're still flirting and enjoying the attention. Jane winced at the truth of Paul's words. I can't live in doubt, and I can't give you more. I wish I could but I just can't. Sharon is completely honest and so caring that I can't imagine her doing the same thing as you. There are no guarantees, but it seems right to me. Jane looked down sadly. She kept her promise. She said she would try for you if I left you, and I think that's what happened in the end. I think she tried to stay out of our problems, but our feelings grew. Jane saw doubt in Paul. His opinion was not fully formed. She was about to insist on her own, but at one point it dawned on her. You're right, Paul. I like being wanted and how it makes me feel. I love sex. I don't regret it. I wanted passion, lust, and desire. It makes me feel alive. Paul's eyes flashed with anger. He was about to attack verbally when he saw a tear in Jane's eyes. He nodded and stood up. Thank you, Jane. If I had loved you less... Maybe we would have worked it out, but you almost destroyed me. We had a wonderful marriage. We still have children, but we need to move on. Tomorrow I will take my things out. Jane managed to hold on until she heard the front door close and then burst into hysterical tears. She had lost him again. She had to let him go, but that didn't make the pain any less. Paul began divorce proceedings both lawyers said it was the most amicable divorce they had ever seen. They continued to pay off half the Mortgachi. Paul was now living with Sharon, so Jane remained in their old house, despite repeated offers to move out. They remained friendly and exchanged events and contacts through their children. Sharon worried about Jane and how lonely she seemed, while her own relationship with Paul blossomed. Jane started going on dates again, but it wasn't the same anymore. The excitement was gone. She wanted what Paul and Sharon had. She saw firsthand how they spent their days and nights together and how they fit together so naturally. She tried really hard to be happy for them, but she couldn't shake the bitter aftertaste. What pained her most was the holiday. Jane and Paul had made a list of places to visit from the years when the children were small and they couldn't afford holidays. Now Paul and Sharon had visited these places together and planned others. Six months later, Paul and Sharon got engaged. This event and the fact that they saw each other so often became too painful for Jane. She moved into an apartment selling their old house and splitting the proceeds with Paul. Jane was still looking for someone to settle down with, but this person seemed elusive. People their age had all sorts of baggage and were quite rigid. It didn't help that she now had a certain reputation that attracted suitors, but none who were looking for a serious long-term relationship. Three months later, an invitation to a wedding followed. Jane could not bring herself to go along with it. Despite the support of the children, they were happy for their father and stepmother, whom they knew and loved so well. Jane sat and thought again about how she had thrown Paul away. Maybe there is a natural justice to this after all. Her selfishness and greed deserve the half of her life that she lives. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think about listening to the next one.